Welcome. I'm Dee Wolfsbane, and this is Story of the Game, a podcast where I take hours of real D&D adventures and weave them into short narratives for your entertainment. Today, we take our first dive into the magical realm of Elkamar, where two core are seeking help to solve the mystery of their disappearing townsfolk. It's a story of love and loss, of mystery and suspicion, where many small choices can lead to either victory or ruin. Will they be able to find a group to help them, or will their entire village be gone by the time they return? Let's find out on our very first episode of Story of the Game. Let me tell you a story of love and loss. The lost city of Dean, a satyr, and a blood hunter. survived against this huge kraken. My goal is the trick of wild magic. Labyrinth. of a plague that swept through. Dragons, I say. The orb of time. Of a hopeless guild. There was this bard. And this is what happened. In the core village of Skagakur, people are going missing. By night, by day, one by one, they disappear without struggle or trace. At first, they thought that some of the villagers had just gone out into the mountains to hunt or adventure, but even though nomadically natured core could not understand why so many would leave Skagakur when the rest of their tribe still remained. Rumors started to float around the village of a monster in the night snatching people who were out on their own. So, one family decided to huddle close together, thinking their numbers would keep them safe. But they were wrong. That night, all three disappeared. And with those three gone, the total missing had reached ten in a village of only hundreds. Skagakor's rangers and monks could do little. Even Sago, the leader of the monastery, as powerful as he was, was at a loss. And so, Yen and Yama Vesen decided to take matters into their own hands. Their brother was already missing, and if help wasn't going to come from within the village, then they would have to search for it from without. The two core rangers left their niece in her grandparents' capable hands, and set out from Skagakor to the largest city they knew of, Idriot, where they hoped they could find hired hands that were used to this type of mystery. Yana and Yaman traveled down the mountain, through forests and fields, across rivers, until finally they entered the city of Idriot. Though they had tried to prepare themselves for what they would find, nothing could have prepared them. They never seen such commotion, never heard such noise in their life. The central strip was a bustle of activity. Crowds encased them, and vendors accosted them from all sides as they passed shops of all kinds, from magic items to talismans to clothes and meats and services of all sorts. The crowds were overwhelming, but so too was the thought of how to navigate the diversity within the city. They knew the central lands were filled with all sorts of races, but in their isolated home they had never seen so many before, and definitely not all in one place. Here, though, in Idriot, the races commingled harmoniously. Humans, elves, half-elves, dwarves, tieflings, turtles, aracocra, dragonborns, gnomes, halflings, and more. Yen and Yaman decided to approach a simple man who was selling cabbages out of a cart. They politely declined his offer and asked him where they could hire people for a task. Though disappointed that they weren't going to buy anything, the cabbage man pointed and gave some complex directions to get to the specialist sphere, where the guild offices resided. There, the man said, they would be able to find the right guild who could help them. Thanking the man, they set off. And though they had his directions, they still struggled to find the specialist sphere, because, well, they got lost. The pair of rangers were great at navigating mountains and forests, but not so good at cities. After dead-ending at a large marble wall, surrounded by imposing statues of historical figures they didn't know, they were approached by the city guard, who kindly directed them to the guild offices. Once there, it became quite apparent that the gold they'd brought with them fell far short of what would be required to hire people for such a long journey. Disheartened and defeated, Yen and Yemen turned away, their last hope gone. They walked the streets in silence, drowning in the sounds all around them. How could they return empty-handed, such abject failures? But there, on the side of the road, was a sign. A positive sign, a sign from Melora that not all hope was lost. The sign read, Searching for gold and magic items? Looking to connect with other like-minded adventurers? Wanting to challenge yourself with new experiences? Then look no further. Come and join us for the fourth annual Transformation Tournament. 
Here at the Transformation Tournament, you will be teamed up with other starting adventurers to compete in a series of tasks. The better you work together, the faster you finish, and the less you get knocked down, the higher your score. Top teams will win gold magic items and perhaps find some new friends along the way. Rules? No killing? And follow the instructions. How to apply? Just enter the Krypton and interview to gain a spot on one of the 20 teams that will compete. Today is the last day. Yen and Yemen looked at each other, dumbfounded. This was it. This was their chance. If they could do well enough in the tournament, then they would win enough gold to hire a team to help them. The specifics of the tournament and what's happened in all of its years of running, well, that's a story for another time. The short version for today is that the tournament begins with an interview, and successful applicants are placed into one of 20 groups. It's just a strange coincidence that every player character is successful, and that they're placed in the same group. Honestly, it's random, I swear. From there, the 20 groups will compete in three stages. Each stage has a different focus. The first stage tests the group's physical abilities. They need to navigate a gauntlet while trying not to get caught. To do so will require strength, stealthiness, and fortitude. In the second stage, the group has to find and navigate their way back to the city before solving a fake assassination attempt in time. This will take intellectual know-how, wise decision-making, and schmoozing of the noble crowd. The third stage is a straight-up, good old-fashioned smackdown fight in Idriot's magnificent Colosseum. The siblings ran into their first issue with the interview. Yaman was silent by nature and difficult to converse with, and Yenna, well, she frequently forgot nouns, which was only exacerbated by the stress of the interview. In the end, though, both managed to impress the interview panel with their physical prowess and knowledge of nature, and they were placed on a team together. The core rangers were less impressed by the other members of their team. Their teammates were capable enough, sure, but they were selfish— They sought their own personal gain and glory, and seemed to want to outdo one another, rather than work with each other. Yen and Yemen didn't trust any of their teammates, and they began to wonder if they could even trust anyone in the city to help them in their mission, even if they had enough gold to hire. Exiting the first round of the tournament, the siblings took up seats in the Great Hall of the Krypton. They sat apart from their teammates and all other tournament participants, and together, they ate in mourning not knowing if they'd wasted all this time coming to Idriot for nothing. And that's when it happened. That's when the clouds parted and the sun started to shine, as a group composed of a tiefling, dragonborns, elves, and a half-one sat down beside them. This group was kind, smart, and asked some amazing questions. This was a group Yen and Yaman could work with. Eventually, one of the elves asked the siblings why they'd enter the tournament, and so they told them, they told them of Skagakor and how it was once a safe haven for all core. They told them how that had all changed, how people were disappearing, and how they'd come here searching for help. Well, the group had fallen in love with these two the moment Yenna had had to resort to calling her home a massive triangular rock in the landscape. She'd had to resort to this type of description because, well... She'd forgotten the word for mountain. The group was so suspicious of the two core, but they were connected to them, connected by this awkwardness that many of them shared. And so, they agreed to meet up after the tournament was complete to discuss the task. And with this new hope on the horizon, Yen and Yemen moved on to stage two of the tournament, and when all three rounds were said and done, they waited outside the Krypton for this group of young adventurers. And they asked them, one final time, are you sure you want to come and help? Without thought of payment and out of the kindness of their hearts, the group agreed. And so, the players had accepted their first quest, to help the sister and brother solve the mystery of their disappearing kin. And now, let's step out of the game for a moment to... Meet Meet the the party. party! This game was made of a large group of first-time players, seven in total. Not actually the largest group of DM, but that's another story. Each player came to the game with a character that was unique and interesting in their own way, and each was able to help the group place fourth in the tournament. First off, our pair of dragonborn druids, cousins by the name of Ferox and Grimstone. Grim for short. 
Both of them are adorably awkward, so perhaps it was a genetic trait, but each of them differed in their manifestation of the social awkwardness. Ferox, a white dragonborn, was prone to staring with her orb-like eyes, as if perpetually a deer in the torchlight. Grim, on the other hand, a black dragonborn, was frequently spaced out and had to be prodded into action on many occasions. The pair were reunited in the transformation tournament after many years apart. In this tournament, they showcased their awkwardness well. After her introduction interview, Ferox stared wide-eyed at a guard, causing her to miss the door and bump into the wall on her way out. Grim, on the other hand, tried to chat up an attractive pair of elves in the second round, oblivious to the fact that he was stealing the thunder from a noble who was doing the same. Next up, Oriana, our red tiefling warlock. She might have been quiet like Grim, but she was ever so attentive. Thinking things through in the background, she offered valuable advice and ideas when she broke her silence. In the tournament, she helped the group out of the pit in round one by rifling through her bag and finding pittens they could wedge between the stones to help them climb. Fourth up is Carrick, our wild magic elven sorcerer. Prone to being kidnapped, she basically wandered into the interview and ended up in the tournament by accident. Though one might not realize based on that first impression, she's actually a fantastic detective. She's able to ask questions to get to the heart of an issue, which came in great use in the second stage of the tournament when they had to solve a fake assassination attempt. Though Carrick had the right questions, it was another elf by the name of Clotho who cracked the case. A sensible, book-smart divination wizard with an eagle familiar by the name of Zeus, she went to talk to the groups who'd already completed the round. Using detect thoughts and some well-placed questions, she was able to obtain a vital clue to unravel the plot. The last two in our party are an odd pair, an elven cleric by the name of Lucifer, a life cleric named Lucifer. Yeah, that happened. Lucifer is a kind, shy kid who scares easily, and he's especially scared of Grimm now. Probably because Grimm keeps talking about eating people, he says humans taste the best, though no one's quite sure whether to believe him or not. And I mean that for both the character and the player. Lucifer was practically adopted by a half-elf named Kumi, who must have had a softer side in addition to being a kick-ass assassin. Kimi is part of a guild called the White Mask and wore such a mask at all times. His assassin's training helped him sneak through the first round of the tournament and pick the locks that needed picking. Well, there you have it. Three elves, a half one, a tiefling, and two dragonborns, tackling the tournament's tasks with a unity that seven newly met members rarely have. Though I do need to mention at this point that their tournament performance wasn't all awesomeness. In the third and final round of the tournament, where they had to fight in a coliseum, the white mask Kumi brazenly walked into the middle of the fighting area and then proceeded to get smothered by a rug and then almost beaten to death by his own teammates before being freed and then shot in the back by Clotho's firebolt. Thanks to the trusty cleric Lucifer, they managed to stay conscious and scrounge together a victory against the animated armor, pack of snakes, and smothering rug. It wasn't pretty, but it got them through. At this point, though, it should have been apparent that they weren't great at fighting, and their battle woes were only getting started. Luckily for them, the core siblings weren't around to watch that fiasco, and so they didn't think better of enlisting their help. So, with the decision made and knowing that time was of the essence, the party used some of their tournament winnings to buy horses, which they got attached to very quickly like they did with all cute things, and started naming them. The first got named Yoshi, and then the next one was Mario, and then third one was Luigi, and, well, you get where they're going with this. So, with their troop of Nintendo-named horses, they took to the roads back to Rakir Mountain, where the core town could be found on its cliffside. The horse ride was pretty uneventful, and since the horses couldn't go up the mountain, the group had to leave the horses at the nearest village. It was a tiny little place not too far from Raycare Mountain. The journey took them a couple of days, so it was the perfect time for the group to ask the core rangers some questions, so they could get a feel of what they were headed into. Though, ask is probably the wrong term for what actually happened. Interrogate seems more appropriate. And Carrick, 
Our aimless adventurer and detective extraordinaire took the lead, while the others provided support as her quick-draw, rapid-fire questions shot out. How long have people been going missing? When were you last in town? Is there any pattern between the disappearances? Where? When? Who? Would anyone have grudges against them? Who's the newest tribe in town? Who knows what's going on in town? Do you have a leader? Who do you think we should speak to first? After the tirade of questions, this is what the group now knew. The disappearances varied in location and time of day, and people had been going missing with increasing frequency. Yen and Yemen had left approximately two weeks ago, and so they didn't know how many more might be missing now. They did know that, although not everyone who disappeared had been a part of the Vesin tribe, the tribe to which Yen and Yama belonged, more members of their tribe had gone missing than any others by a long shot. The town itself was composed of many different core tribes, who were always welcome to come and find a home in Skagakor. Some tribes would stay for an extended period of time, though some would come rarely and leave quite quickly. The core were nomadic in nature, after all. For the most part, the tribes lived in harmony within the village. Very few held grudges, so it was unclear who might have an issue with the Vesin tribe. Damni, their missing brother, had run into an issue with the Visini, though they believed it to be more about food or something that the Visini was cooking, they weren't really sure. In terms of who was the newest tribe in town, well, that would have to be the Dragsagor, who had arrived only a week before the disappearances began. As for who to talk to, well, there's two people. Sago, the leader of the Ice of Rakor Monastery. Didn't belong to any tribe, but he had been in Skagakor for longer than, well, anyone really knows. All the core figured he was ancient and lived forever. They weren't quite sure how or why, but he was their one constant, their bedrock. The other person the siblings suggested to talk to was Mebo. He was the owner of the local tavern and inn, and as such had a pulse on everything that was happening in the town. But before they got to any investigating, Yen and Yaman desperately wanted to check in on their niece, Nithni. They had left her with her grandparents in their family home, and they could only hope the Malor had kept her safe all this time. Satisfied that they knew what they were stepping into, the group made camp at the base of Rakir Mountain, along a beautiful lake inside a forest. As the sun began to set, Clotho scouted the area with her eagle familiar Zeus, before the group felt safe bedding down for the night. Oriana, our tiefling warlock, and Lucifer, the child cleric, took first watch. They sat in darkness as the snores of their fellows kept them company. Then, into the night, rumbling started to accompany the snores. Louder and louder and louder they became. Quickly Oriana and Lucifer woke the others, and weapons were drawn. The rumblings paused. And then... <sighs> the ground exploded as a large insectoid monstrosity burst out of it, spraying acid across the still-clumped-up group. Those with dark vision could see its jagged form, its pincers and claws seeming impossibly large as its four beady black eyes honed in on its dinner. Burning from the acid, the group started to fight back. Our spellcasters, Clotho, Oriana, and Carrick sent attack spells and cantrips at the Onkeg, Grim threw a hand axe that missed its mark as his fellow druid Ferox transformed into a bear and charged alongside Yenna, whose short swords were raised. Lucifer did damage control in the back as Yaman and Kumi loosed arrows. Though some of the attacks made contact, most glanced off the monstrosity's chitinous armor or missed completely. The Ankeg still stood, ready to strike again when... <sighs> A second Onkeg joined the fray, spraying acid over those in the back as the first slashed at Ferox's bare form. This is when the group split into two minds of what to do. Those in the back yelled, Get to the lake! and broke for the water's edge. Though Ferox and the core stood firm, as, waist deep in the water, the spellcasters and bow users flung projectiles at the Onkegs. Not even fifteen seconds later, the battle was done. Everyone in the group was still conscious. Half of them were waist-deep in the freezing lake, while the other half stood over the Onkeg's corpses. When the adrenaline wore off, Sodden and Solemn, the group went back to sleep, realizing that if they didn't work together and unite when fighting, then they would all be at risk. 
The following day, they set off once more. They were still about a day and a half's journey away from Skagakor. The Corps, being such good climbers, had a more direct route, but it was far too dangerous for the party to attempt. The clouds grew in strength as the group made their long trek up Raykir Mountain. Bundled tightly against the chilly mountain air, they hiked along the paths and scrambled up rocks. Even though they were on the safer route, there were still a few times that the ascent became precarious. Many slipped on the way, but with Oriana's rope and the gloves of climbing that Clotho had won in the tournament, they managed to help each other ascend. Yenna suggested that they stop at a ledge that was about midway to Skagakur for one final night under the stars. It was a common place for the rangers and tribes to rest while out in the mountains. The rocky ground of the ledge was smoother than the rest of the mountain, as if it had been worn down by feet and camping over the many years it had been in use. The flat ledge was to the side of the path and stopped abruptly at the sheer mountain face that continued up acting as a backrest for them. The edge, too, was also a sheer drop down, hundreds of feet, that would surely kill anyone who fell. As the sun set, the group divided up the watches. Yenna volunteered to go first, in thanks of the group coming along, and Ferox quickly decided to keep Yenna company. When Yamin volunteered for the second watch, White Mask Kumi agreed to join him, along with our detective Carrick. As the group bedded down for the night, the full moon rose, lighting up the sky and bathing the valley in a silvery white light. The trees in the valley appeared to dance in the wind, as the stars and moon glittered off the lake's surface far below. Behind all this, the rest of the mountain range stood vigil over the descending darkness. Yenna sat with her legs dangling out over the ledge, taking in the scene. Her white hair shone in the moonlight, as did her white tattoos that were emblazoned on her light blue skin. Ferox, our white dragonborn druid, sat down beside Yenna, perhaps closer than one would normally do, as she too looked out over the beautiful valley. The night had warmed for them. And like a pair of teenagers trying to impress their first crush, their conversation began. Ferox spoke of her home and how her family had been outcasts due to their tales, which most other dragonborns in Drenar did not have. A short awkward silence followed, during which ravens flew overhead. It was finally broken when Ferox inquired about Yenna's tattoos. Yenna explained that each core was tattooed when they came of age with their family crest. From there, important deeds would add new tattoos spreading from the family one, since all things started with family. As a ranger, she had helped the village fight off monsters and brought home food for everyone, earning many honors. That's when their conversation turned to nature, which both Yenna and Ferox had an affinity for. Ferox spoke of transforming into an animal for the first time, and as she did so, she touched her necklace, which was adorned with a dozen or so teeth projecting like talons from a paw. Yenna reciprocated by explaining how the Corps worshipped Melora, the goddess of wild places. There was even a spring in town that had come from Melora's blessing. And as the raven crows started to die down, Yenna sang out over the valley, a hauntingly beautiful tune to Melora. Ferox just listened, staring at Yenna, staring with her eyes as wide as the moon above and glowing just as brightly. Once Yenna was done and the echoes of the song dissipated through the mountains, Ferox said, That's beautiful. Yeah, I got nothing like that. Yenna smiled shyly. The two took each other's hand and snuggled a little closer, watching the valley in a beautiful silence as the moon continued its ascent. Out of game! The silence and the beautiful mood was broken by the rest of my players chanting, Ship, 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 ship! Now, if you're not aware what the term ship means, you're not alone. I had no clue. Apparently, it's the new trendy term that's short for relationship. It basically means that the players wanted Yen and Ferox to form a relationship or get together. Here's how you would use it in a sentence. <clears throat> 
the players in this game are shipping Yenna and Ferox. Or, the players in this game are trying to ship Yenna and Ferox. This was the first time in this game that I heard this chant, and it was definitely not going to be the last time. After a while of Yenna and Ferox staring out, they took note again of the ravens that were still flying overhead, and realized for the first time that they weren't just going anywhere. They were flying into a small hole about 20 feet up the sheer rock face behind them. Wanting to impress Yenna after the wonderful evening, Ferox took charge, transforming into a squirrel and scurrying up the rock to the opening where the ravens were disappearing through. After a short tunnel, she could tell by the echo that it opened up into a cavernous space, and that she would drop about 20 feet if she took another step. Cautiously and smartly, she exited the way she had come. Both her and Yenna agreed that it would be best to wait until morning, when the others would be awake and rested to help them explore. And so, the watch of teenage-like romance ended, and the two went to sleep right beside one another. Would a second watch of romance follow? Now, before we get into the second watch, I want to give you a bit of background. You see, if you don't know in Dungeons & Dragons... There are players who are playing the game, each with their own characters, like Carrick and Ferox. And then there's me, the DM, or Dungeon Master. Now, the Dungeon Master plays all the other characters, which we call NPCs, which Yaman and Yenna are. We also come up with all the settings, the stories, pretty much everything else that happens in the world. So, we got a lot to keep track of. And specifically with Yaman... He wasn't actually always named Yaman. Initially, he was named Yamna, and that's what was written on my sheet. But when I introduced the two siblings back in the tournament, by accident, I said Yaman, which got related to ramen, specifically the noodles, and my players had a field day with it, after which I could hardly change it back, so Yamna became Yaman. I chose not to tell my players this. I made it look like I meant to all along. You know how it is, fellow DMs. Let's get back into the game and see how this second watch goes. It was clear by now that our white mask Humi liked Yaman, and Carrick, our aimlessly wandering detective, knew this. So she decided to be Kumi's wing woman, as it were, and pretended to busy herself as Kumi approached Yaman who is leaning against the back rock face, arms crossed, staring out into the night. Kimi struck up the most awkward conversation yet, and after Ferox's constant staring and Yenna forgetting words all the time, that was saying something. To be fair, it wasn't Kimi's fault. He tried to speak about his past that led him to being an assassin, and about the white mask he always wore, but Yaman was probably the worst conversationalist in the group. And again, that's saying something. Even though his sister frequently forgot nouns, Yaman would still normally let her do the talking. His curt replies without much else wasn't conducive to easy conversation. He did manage to mention some hunts he had been on, and... Well, no, that that was it. That was everything he talked about. To Kumi's credit, he tried to keep the conversation rolling by explaining that he could only remove his mask at a full moon, and tonight was a full moon. For the first time since he had joined the group, Kimi unmasked, and Yaman and Carrick were able to see his delicate half-elven features. With still no response from Yaman, and not knowing where to go from there, the chit-chat rolled to a halt. Carrick had been watching this train wreck from the side, and couldn't take it any longer. Apologizing to Yaman, she pulled Kimi away for a sidebar. Her advice? Just tell him how you feel, like... Just say it. Just tell him flat out. After this, a rousing pep talk followed, and Carrick then sent Kumi back into the game. Kumi proceeded to stutter out that he liked Yaman and was hoping to spend some time with him. A still oblivious Yaman responded that he liked Kumi too, and of course they'd be spending more time together because they were coming to the village and needed their help, right? Realizing that Yaman didn't understand what he meant, Kimi tried again. And again. And again. 
Kimi's nervousness grew with each attempt, but it was nothing compared to Carrick's frustration. She eventually just trounced right up and said, I'm trying to ship you two. Kumi took this opportunity to explain flat out to the still confused Yaman, not knowing what ship actually meant. She's talking about us in a romantic relationship. Yaman looked from Kumi's unmasked face to Carrick, then back to Kumi, then Carrick and Kumi again, before realization finally caught up with him. His eyes and mouth grew wide as he instinctually tried to move away and said, Sorry, I, I, I don't like males in that way. I'm sorry. From the players at my table, this elicited some And they all turned to the female player who was playing our male Kumi. Completely outraged and abhorred, she turned to me and said, Yen is gay? Why isn't Yemen gay? To which I replied, Because not everyone in the world is going to be gay. She folded her arms across her chest and huffed. In the end, she conceded the point. Though, she still wasn't happy about it. And with that, our night of romance had come to an end. The rest of the watches passed without incident, and soon they'd all awaken to learn of the cave hidden behind them, and be motivated to investigate. Would it contain secrets that might help them on their journey? Or was it a trap? Or is it something completely unexpected? To find out, you'll have to tune in next episode. I hope you enjoyed this first episode of Story of the Game. If you want to know what happens next and how everything turns out, make sure you like and subscribe on whatever platform you're using. You can also sign up for my mailing list at dwolfspain.com to be notified whenever a new episode or story arc becomes available. While you're there, feel free to check out my young adult sci-fi fantasy novel for even more epic tales. Thank you very much for listening, and come join me next time to continue the disappearing debacle arc of Story of the Game. Okay, I'm freaking fixing up my writing. Okay, let's try this. Let's do it.